<clears throat> Broadcasting. Looking promising. Oh, yeah. good. Yep. Perfect. All right, I'll shut that down. And g'day, everyone. We are live on Facebook. <laughs> Happy Thursday. Um, guys, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Danny Catania, and I'm the Product Education Specialist for Isogenix ANZ. Um, I'm a qualified dietitian, sports dietitian, um, and I am very privileged to be interviewing this big gun over here. Um, we have the incredible David Despain with us. He is our Director of Scientific uh, Communications and Affairs um, at our home office in Arizona. So he's kindly hanging back tonight to, um, to help us, you know, answer the big questions, right? <laughs> That's right. Thanks for having me on, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Well, um, let's get into it. So, guys, the, the question that we really wanted to tackle to, uh, today, tonight, wherever you're tuning in from, is really around processed food. So when we think about processed food, we think about, um, you know, all of the stuff that we probably shouldn't be eating, right? The junk food, that's what we kind of conjure up. And I often hear the question or the uh, a common objection that comes up with a lot of people who, um, you know, would be, would be really great for them to start isogenics, but one of the hesitations that they have is, but I don't eat processed food or I prefer to eat whole foods. So we're really going to address that in this, in this short video. So David, can we just go back a step? Can you explain what processed food really is, where it came from, what we are, what it's become today? Well, uh, Danny, in, in, pre in preparation for this, for this uh, call, I, I pulled out my old food science textbook. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> uh, just, to, to, just to give you uh, um, uh, a, a flavor of what, um, what processing uh, is. I looked up the definition of food processing within this book and it's comprised of so many things. So uh, in terms of, um, it, basically a little bit of history is that humans have always really processed their food in some way. You know, we've, in, in preparing food where we always take steps to do things to food, to, uh, to make it easier to eat, to reduce toxins out of it. Uh, one element of that is, is cooking or fermentation. Uh, we make it easier to eat by grinding food. All of these are different types of processing steps. We do things to make foods safer. Um, and so that all of that is encompassed within processed food. But when we talk about processed food as a culture, um, instead of scientifically, what we really mean is the types of, of hyper processed foods that where nutrition has been stripped out of a food and you're left with just the, the tasty stuff, you know, the, the junk food. So, um, so you could think of processed food historically uh, whereas uh, it used to be that, that processing steps were taken just to make food a little bit safer or to extend their shelf life. Uh, I always like to t talk historically in terms of processed foods as being, um, you know, about 50 years ago, processed food started to be more about creating foods for, that were designed for overconsumption, which basically to me means you're stripping out vitamin, all the stuff that tastes bad or or has a short shelf life. So um, so things like essential fats, vitamins and minerals, proteins, fiber, uh, fiber yeah, fiber go uh, leaves, and you leave only the stuff that really prompts overconsumption. So uh, that can be whittled down to salt, uh, sugar or carbs, and solid fats. Solid fats, uh, you know, these things. Uh, have little satiety value, so they don't really satisfy you very much, like protein or or fiber does. But uh, and you and you and if you go into a supermarket, you can see various examples of these. If you walk down um, any aisle of the supermarket, you, you we see we see uh, uh, cereals that are just essentially sugar and carbs and very little nutrition. We see uh, you see all sorts of uh, I think 
when, when we were doing our science roadshow, I, I brought up a hot dog. You know, you have the bun that is just basically refined uh, flour, uh, made of refi refined flour and mostly just carbs, no fiber, nothing. And then you have the hot dog, which is mo the major it has some protein in it, but it's mostly fat. Um, and then, and then on top of the hot dog, you, you're you're putting on ketchup, which is mostly sugar. And so you see these different examples of layers of salt, sugar, and fat. Um, and you can uh, certainly uh, what and I and I like to say, you know, these th this is the food industry creating various forms of salt, sugar, fat combinations. To and when you are going into a supermarket and having all of these different foods around you, uh, it makes it really hard to not overeat. Uh, and so that's what we're talking about in terms of junk food and processed foods. And this is why nutritionists traditionally have said, you know, try to avoid the processed foods because it's really easy to eat too much cereal. It's really easy to eat too many donuts. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really white hard. Bread. Yeah, it's, it, it's too easy to eat too much to, to eat too much white bread or pasta. Uh, it's a lot harder to overeat uh, fruits and vegetables yes. when they're in their whole form. So that's, that's kind of what process, I think that's why the word processing gets a bad rep mm -hmm. and uh, food scientists have gotten kind of a bad rep because of that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's really the history there. Yeah. Well, I think if you've really summed that up well, and I guess um, one of the things I've heard you say as well, we talked about in the roadshow was, um, you know, that the way that food, that the, the processed food that we've come to know, like that salt, sugar, and fat is really designed so that you can't stop at just one. So let's talk about that, right? How is isogenics different? Yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right. So there's, there's whole entire food science departments dedicated to creating the perfect potato chip and you can let you know there was a big article a feature article on the New York Times just about that about about that specifically about how to drive consumption of different foods so that and really it's that design of you know trying to create the perfect food so that you can't eat just one uh, I think where what this is this is a really key difference with isogenics because um, isogenics you could argue uh, because it's because it's manufactured, it's also a processed food, but the design is completely different. The design is, uh, I, I like to say it's nutritionally engineered. And in my view, it's a lot harder to do because we are creating, uh, for example, a, a shake that is designed to satisfy you and nourish you. And it has to contain all of the right, uh, it has to contain the fiber, the protein, the quality protein, the essential fats and the vitamins and minerals. And we still, as food scientists, are still charged with trying to make it taste as good as as ice cream. So um, that's- It's accomplished there because it really, it does. You know, it's very satisfying. It does taste like ice cream, you know. Um, sorry to interrupt, go on. No, well, I was just, I was just gonna say the design is not to drive overconsumption, but actually do the opposite of overconsumption, which is to nourish and satisfy you. And that's, that's a huge distinction. And that's why I, I, when people ask me, you know, uh, is what, don't you consider a, a, an isolating shake to be processed food? I was saying you're, you're missing a big element there. It's the design, uh, and it's, and the differences in its design. This, this is nutri, I, I would say it's nutritionally engineered in, instead of being designed for overconsumption. That's a key distinction. Mm -hmm. Just to rephrase that, so does so nutritionally engineered versus designed for overconsumption. I think that's huge. Um, mm -hmm. So, David, I know that with a lot of the typical processed food, right, that's high in salt, sugar, and all fat. Um, I know that um, when it comes to creating really healthy, healthily, um, and nutritionally engineered foods, that it is much easier to use artificial ingredients. They're much more stable. They taste good. Um, but we have a policy where we will only use natural ingredients. Um, do you want to talk about the challenges here and, and really about um, why we're so committed to using natural ingredients? Yeah, so uh, in, making our, in, in making our products, we use all sorts of natural ingredients. We use dried uh, powders. We've, we use freeze-dried powders or spray-dried powders. Uh, our, um, we use filtered ingredients like our whey protein that, that comes from, it comes from natural milk, but it's filled, it's filtered. 
uh, we use even in, even in our flavors, we're using natural flavors, which means that the, the flavors are come from uh, extracts of spices or essential oils. Uh, they're also a lot harder to work with because uh, they don't have the shelf life that artificial uh, flavors and sweeteners have. So we're using natural ingredients makes things a little bit harder for us. Um, what I, I shared the example, um, we were talking about uh, various examples of this. Like it's, it's really easy uh, for a food scientist to use an artificial red color, but uh, we can't use an artificial red color. So what we do is we use, uh, we'll use a natural color uh, for, for strawberry, for example, we'll use like a tomato concentrate or lycopene, uh, which is the actual chemical in tomato, the carotenoid that makes it red. Uh, and, um, and, to, uh, and, and also, and we, use, we actually use purple carrot as a way to color things like um, cleanse for life. You know, that it's it, uh, cleanse for life, we use purple carrot, which also, uh, it, it turns it purple because of its natural anthocyan, anthocyanins. Um, and therein also creates a benefit because anthocyanins, as you probably know, they, they, they work like antioxidants and they're very healthy. They're found in blueberries too. And uh, they happen to be found in purple carrots. So we use these uh, natural ingredients and in the process of naturally coloring uh, something like Cleanse for Life, we actually make the product even more effective and, and, uh, and healthy. So uh, I, I like that. I think that's, as a nutritionist, um, I find that uh, that kind of a challenge uh, really fun and interesting. And, I, and it's, um, it's, and I, I kind of wish more food companies would do, do that sort of thing. So again, uh, it's a different type of uh, design and a really different type of objective when you're trying to create healthy food uh, with only natural ingredients than it is to create just processed food that people will, that will sit on a shelf and attract attention um, and, and make great things. Yeah, and just and create consumption, right? So mm -hmm. that's that's really different. And it's interesting what you said about the um, you know saying the strawberry shake because we expect strawberry to be pink. It's just part of the way that we eat and we expect. Um, but like you said, you know, I'm so I'm so proud of what we do here at Isogenics, where we really um, we really get creative about how we use um, products that or you know compounds that exist in nature to um, improve the nutritional value and the, the quality of, of the of the foods that we provide. So I suppose that leads really nicely onto the next question that usually comes up. So a lot of and I'll keep this polite, but I've seen a lot of internet bloggers um, and experts and in inverted commas um, talking about you know that they you know preaching the advice that you should avoid all ingredients that you can't pronounce or that your grandmother wouldn't recognize. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about the sort of the thinking behind that? And um, I understand where it's coming from, but I don't think that's the whole story. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, I, I think it's uh, I think it's it's a misunderstanding of food you see food is made up of chemicals we all eat, we eat basically edible chemicals that's what food is is edible chemicals and when you break a food down into its chemical constituents the, they have long chemically names so for example vitamin c the chemical name for vitamin c is ascorbic acid the chemical name for vitamin d is cholecalciferol uh, the, and I could go on and on. There's uh, the, these chemical calcium names. Calcium phosphate usually or, or tricalcium phosphate, you know? Right. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's that because you can't pronounce it, it's artificial. And it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it's bad for you. In fact, the opposite could be true. Vitamin C is uh, absolutely good for you. So there's, there's, um, so there's, there's definitely, um, some misunderstanding there. It's true that you can add some artificial ingredients, uh, and those have chemical names too. But it doesn't mean uh, one of one of the things that we that we shared at on our science roadshow is a an illustration of uh, a chemistry teacher in Melbourne uh, took a banana and a blueberry and a and an egg, right, and and broke those broke uh, broke those down into its chemical components. And created 
an ingredient label. So it looks like it looks like a whole food that has an ingredient label, and that ingredient label is just as long as any other processed food. Very sad, um, too. Right, and and all and some of the chemicals that are in the whole food, like um, like a blueberry. Uh, is, uh, some of the chemicals are potentially bad for you, like benzene uh, that exists naturally in blueberries. And uh, some of the some of the chemical names sound really awful and and nasty, and but they're they're in natural foods. So it doesn't, you know, even natural foods can contain some chemicals that are not desirable in some, in some cases. Um, and so that's, that's uh, important, an, an important distinction. Again, what you have to rely more on is, is the, um, is the design of the food and what, uh, and what kind of uh, benefit you're expecting to generate from it. And it's to completely possible to create, for example, um, a meal replacement shake that contains all of the nutrients that you need in a, in a meal uh, and have that. And of course, that, that list of ingredients is going to be uh, somewhat long, but it but it's still can be absolutely healthy for you. It's definitely a misunderstanding and a myth really that that because it has a long or uh, because it has a long ingredient list or it has unpronounceable ingredients it can't be healthy that's just certainly not true mm -hmm. and and quite ignorant um yeah. david i think i suppose i suppose that leads on to my last question which is really um you know we hear around we hear one of the um the objections as i mentioned at the beginning is around uh, but I, I prefer not to do shakes i really want to focus on whole foods so why what is the science behind using your replacement shakes that are, are really nourishing and designed to nourish you versus whole foods for weight loss yeah well uh one of the reasons uh why meal replacements work why there's so much science that have shown that meal replacement shakes work so well is really because people really have a hard time uh, choosing the right foods and most of all portion control. So when people go on diets, uh, they might eliminate a, an entire food group. Uh, I know, you know, we've, we see this all the time. They might eliminate uh, all carbohydrates and, and uh, then they end up with nutrient deficiencies uh, because they're not getting enough fruits and vegetables or fortified whole or, or whole grains or fortified grains. Uh, they might, you might have people who eliminate uh, animal foods completely and just go on a vegetarian diet. Uh, and then they also have nutrient deficiencies or, or you can have, you know, people, people will try to do a, a whole foods diet. And because they're not familiar with uh, how many calories are in each food, they end up overeating anyway. And so th this is a common issue. And uh, it was something that we demonstrated in one in uh, two of our studies. Uh, the first one was at University of Illinois, Chicago, where we, we compared using an iso isogenic system um, that was comprised of doing shake days with two shakes per day, and then still a meal that, it, that was comprised of whole foods. Uh, and then uh, compared that against a diet of traditionally a traditionally uh, um, uh, traditionally health, heart healthy diet that it, that was basically a whole foods based diet, uh, and the and uh, even even with the patients on the whole foods diet, even though they received dietary counseling and uh, from a dietitian, uh, they they did lose some weight, but they didn't lose as much weight as the isogenics uh, group um, and, the, and the folks on the isogenics group, they, uh, um, they lost weight more consistently week to week and it was easier for them to lose weight. Uh, so um, I think uh, in terms of the science, uh, it just demonstrates again that meal replacement shakes can work uh, and are more, can be more effective and just easier. Uh, the other thing I would just add is that uh, we're not, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to give up whole foods. Of course, we are, we would encourage people to, uh, have whole foods. It's just, it's, it's just certainly easier. And if you, and if you think about it, I think about it in my own life, um, I run into an issue where my wife makes, 
Uh, she likes to make amazing dinners for me and it's hard to say no to them. And so I know that having a couple of shakes earlier in the day before I get home at dinner time uh, is important for me to be able to maintain, uh, to be able to control calories. Uh, what, uh, one thing I, I forgot to mention, Danny, uh, in relation to salt, sugar, and fat is also in, in, uh, in a, not, the U not the University of Illinois study, but in our Skidmore College study, we, we demonstrated that um, people using our shakes uh, ended up reducing uh, a lot of their calories from, uh, from carbohydrates and fats, especially carbohydrates, and they, and they reduced a lot of their sodium intake. So once again, you're demonstrating the opposite of what normally happens with processed foods. With, with people who usually eat a lot of processed foods like pizza and french fries and hamburgers and breads, uh, what you see is that they end up overeating, uh, they, they getting, they're getting excess calories, mostly from carbohydrates and fats, and, they, um, and their sodium intake is sky high. And what we demonstrated in, in the Skidmore College study is that people cut their, cut their carbohydrate uh, in half, cut their sugar intake in half, uh, and cut their sodium by um, almost two thirds. So um, that's definitely, that's definitely huge. And another, another example, of how shakes are truly different and cannot be compared to other kinds of, of processed foods. Mm -hmm. And I think just to summarize that, David, thank you for sharing all of that. So I think, um, you know, the, when we think about whole foods, we think about like the perception of what we think about as whole foods is very different to reality, right? Like when I think about whole foods, I think about, you know, going to the farmer's market and like, you know, just being organized for the whole week and, um, you know, just, you know, um, doing a lot of sort of food prep, in, you know, in a, advance. And of course, sometimes we have these weeks or days. Um, but then the reality is, you know, there's food going off in the, you know, veggie crisper in the fridge. There might be, you know, because, you, you know, just through lack of time, you know, change of plans, um, no time to cook. So it might be, you know, relying on someone else to cook or getting takeaway, right? So our perception and versus reality is often a little distorted. Um, so I, um, I just I remember us talking about that. And I think, like you said, um, you know, it's really like, um, and we've talked about this before, that um, really, you know, dietitians will um, will resist sharing this knowledge. But, you know, weight loss, you know, meal replacement shakes are one of the most proven, not just in our studies, but in time and time again, right, in, in a lot of published clinical studies, um, weight, that weight loss or sorry, meal replacement shakes are one of the best ways and most effective ways to lose weight and also maintain it on a modified lifestyle. So, um, I, I thank you, David, so much for sharing everything that you did. Um, I love that, you know, we always talk about, you know, when we start isogenics doesn't mean don't, you know, go and eat lots of processed food. It's not, it's absolutely not what we preach. You know, it is really about supporting a, a really good health food, whole, whole foods diet. I'll get that out um, with, um, with, with, you know, some really well-designed nutritionally engineered foods. Um, so thank you, David, for um, uh, downloading some of that for us. And, um, and we'll, I can't wait for our next video. So guys, thanks for tuning in. And um, if you'd like to have any of your questions answered, please send them into product questions, ANZ at isogenicscorp.com. Bye for now, guys. See you all next week. Have a great one. Thanks, David.